set off as a refutation of it. And that's why I bring up the Darwin Fitzroy connection. Now, let's think about it. Just in the abstract, if you wanted to overturn natural theology, how would you do it? Now, I can imagine two strategies, of which the second is the far more radical. The first would be, well, natural theology insists that nature is benevolent and the organisms are well-designed. Since organisms are not always well-designed and they're full of imperfections, like pandas with funny thumbs that don't work very well and a whole variety of other obvious imperfections, why not just catalog all of nature's nonsense? and then suggest that maybe this isn't the kind of God you want. If nature really reflects God and nature is full of imperfection, maybe you ought to rethink that. That's a pretty radical argument, but that's not the one Darwin used. Darwin used a more radical argument. The more radical argument is to say, well, the claims of natural, selection, natural theology are correct. That is, nature is well-designed. There are exceptions, pandas, thumbs, etc., but nature in general is well-designed. That's right, but guess what? That good design does not record the direct skills and creative powers of a deity. In fact, ironically, worse than ironically, almost viciously oppositely, the good design of organisms arises from a natural process whose moral meaning, if you sought moral meaning in natural processes, which you should not, Darwin tells us, I come back to that at the very end, if you sought moral meaning and it would have an import exactly opposite to what you wish to read as the moral meaning in nature. In short, the only thing that's happening out there is that organisms are struggling for themselves. There is this reproductive competition going on. That's what natural selection is. Organisms that leave more surviving offspring are the victors, and that's all that's happening out there in nature. There is nothing in the mechanics of nature, Darwin tells us, about the good of the species the good of the ecosystem, any higher order harmony. The only mechanical process operating out there is that organisms are struggling for themselves and nothing else. That's it. If there's good design, which there is, if ecosystems are harmonious, which they are, that is only a side consequence. That is only a sequel. It does not reflect the fundamental causality. The only thing that's happening is that organisms are struggling for themselves. Now, that's a really radical argument, to admit the phenomenon, but to claim that its production and its import are exactly opposite to what natural selection insisted upon. Now, where does Darwin get that from? Because that really is fundamentally the most radical part of the theory. He didn't get it from the tortoises of the Galapagos. He didn't get it from the finches, which he misinterpreted entirely when he was there, contrary to legend. It's a very complicated story. But if you were to epitomize it in the least inaccurate simplification, he got it from Adam Smith's economics. We know that in the three months before he put together the theory in 1838, he was intently studying through Dougald Stewart the life of Adam Smith and the Scottish economists, and he was reading statistical literature to try to understand how Scottish economic theory treated the role of the individual in setting up entire systems through their side consequences. Think about Adam Smith's system again and what's delicious about it in its own radicalism. That is, we want ordered and harmonious economies, right? Now, how do you get an ordered and harmonious economy? Clearly, you would think, certainly I would think, it seems most reasonable, that if you want an ordered economy, you should get all the people who are smart and understand economics, give them power, sit them around a table, and let them pass rules. That'll give you the ordered economy. Isn't that obviously the most direct way of doing it? Its analogy is let God just make the stuff directly, right? But Adam Smith says, no, you want to do something that looks exactly the opposite, at least at first glance. What you want to do is let individuals struggle for personal profit and let them do so in an absolutely untrammeled way, lest they fare. Then, in one of the most glorious metaphors in all our language, he says, through the action of an invisible hand, because nothing, there really is no agent controlling it, it's just the invisible hand, you're just letting individuals struggle for profit freely. The ones who do it well knock out the others, the ones who do it well balance each other off. So through that elimination you get good design, through the balancing you get harmonious ecosystems or economies. And by letting individuals struggle for their personal gain, as a side consequence you end up with a well-functioning economy. Now the argument is exactly the same for natural selection in nature. It's one of the most interesting examples I know in the history of science of the 
fruitful transfer of a model from one profession to a very different one. What's the analog of the struggle for personal profit in nature? You struggle for reproductive success. And what's the analog of the well-functioning economy? It's, it's the ecosystem. It's balanced. What's the analog of organisms that do it well? It's well-designed creatures. It all arises as side consequence of the action of the invisible hand, organisms struggling for themselves alone. Now, there is, a before I get off, there's a supreme irony in all of this. And that is, we do not and have not and have never let Adam Smith's system work in economics. We can't. Because we're moral agents. The Darwinian system, is, or the Smithian system, is very indirect. You get anything good. You get things good by eliminating those that aren't so good. So to get a good state, you have to eliminate hundreds of others. Now, the hecatomb of deaths involved is just too great for us to bear. As moral agents, we do not allow a system of pure laissez-faire to operate. But, as Darwin was so fond of pointing out, nature doesn't have to be efficient. Nature was here for billions of years before we ever got here. Nature is not a moral agent. Nature operates as she does, and that's all there is to it. If this inefficient Adam Smith invisible hand is the mode of nature, then so be it. That's how it works. And so there isn't the moral control. We, we don't stop it. We can't stop it. And so ironically, Adam Smith's system doesn't work in economics. We don't let it, thank goodness. But it may be the way in which nature fundamentally operates. So that is surely the most radical component of Darwin's theory, the purposelessness of it, the extreme naturalism, the lack of any intent, the Adam Smith operation, the lack of any inherent morality. And that's probably the feature that we're still least comfortable with to this very day, but it certainly makes for a fascinating theory and seems to be right, so far as we can tell, at least now.